let me tell you a little bit about him because he's just like a heavy weight of education. No, I get it. Uh, he is the man, Derek Wenmouth, who, with the late Dr. Vince Ham and Papa Nick Billows, established Tate Ahoro Co Education 20 years ago this year. And he also established ULU. So Derek was honoured beautifully, I hear, at last night's dinner. But this is our opportunity to hear why he remains one of the most influential leaders in Aotearoa's education landscape. If you don't know already, he's a former educator and policy writer. He's advised schools and government agencies on shaping the future of education. After his time at Tate Ahoro, he established Future Makers. He's driven by his belief in education as a pathway to self-improvement and a fundamental right to all. Now I saw Janelle, everyone was standing up for Butterbean. That's right. Two by, two by. Get ready, Butterbean. Get a quick bite. It's my pleasure to be with you today, and it's really even more of a pleasure because there's some people in the hall. I always feel on that last day of Yulu, we had a bit of a ups and downs in time with people taking early flights. But it's, it's a great honour, a great pleasure to be here. And I want to just start by saying a thank you, really, to, um, to all of Tatai Ahuro for getting the old, bald, white guy out of retirement to, uh, <laughs> to sort of close things off. But also to, um, to Hannah for your kind words last night. It meant a lot. Um, I, I want to take the opportunity today, really, as, as a final keynote. There were so many things, boy, I wanted to say, and even more after listening to the speakers that we've had through our time here, uh, but I want to just narrow it down. I'd like to give, take the opportunity really on this 20 years to, to um, I guess, share a little bit of history. And I'm using a metaphor here. In fact, I've got it in the back pocket. I brought this thing along here because most of you probably wouldn't know looking at me now, but the one thing that saved me at school from quite a lot of bullying that you tend to get when you've got ears like mine, and my hair, although it's not here now, used to be uncontrollable, um, but I was a very fast runner, which got me out of a lot of trouble, and it also got me into the first 15. But uh, one of the things I learned about running was the importance of one of these things. I used to love the relay. I often used to be the anchor in the relay. And the relay, the, this, this, the concept of a baton, um, the way I made this in my garage, I didn't get a chance to paint it blue uh, like that. But you'll notice that on the, on the slide I've put the words pushing the boundaries because that's really the focus of what I want to try and weave together here today. And for me, it's about taking this baton. It, it signifies a whole lot of things. It's, it's about the duty that you have as a member of a team. And when you're passing it on, you're, you're denoting really that success really denotes the collective effort. Right? And as you pass it on the next person, it's, it's also as you pass it on, you're relieving yourself of, of the responsibility you have in passing it on to the next one. So there's a lot of things here. I'm going to refer to my little baton here throughout because in some ways that's what I'm doing today. Right? There's, there's a lot of passing the baton taking place. But I want to introduce you to some people who were with me at the start there. Um, the gang, as it was called, you heard them referred to. Um, Dr. Vince Ham, who sadly passed away some years ago now, was, was a guy I met back in the <coughs> century, 1980s. Um, and we, we ended up lecturing at the Christchurch College of Education together. Vince, just a little bit, he was the, the mad history teacher at uh, Nelson College for Girls. Uh, and he was mad because he also found this fascination with computers. And he had the computer in the back of his own room where no one else did. Remember, this was the 1980s. Uh, and he got fascinated. By the time he came to the Christchurch College of Education, he and I met, he was actually teaching himself how to program. And he programmed a, a piece of software that was bought by a lot of people at the time. And it was actually uh, 
combining some real interest he had as in his story, and he was deeply interested in the impact of Māori and the history of New Zealand through a Māori lens. And in fact, the first time I ever met Vince was uh, before I was at the college at a, at a hui of the Computers and Education Society in Christchurch. And Vince got up and did the, the uh, kōrero on the paipai. Uh, it was um, how on earth he managed to, to remember the whole thing, but that was such was his commitment. And so his piece of software was quite remarkable. It was one that actually, on an old Apple IIe, can you believe it or not, but it actually was the, uh, an archaeological dig of a Māori past site that introduced you to the history of New Zealand through the artefacts that you dug up. All right? Amazing guy. Now that was, that was Vince. Then Papa Nick. Well, we all, we all have memories of Papa Nick, but he, my memory of him was the guy that had taken over the Nelson Education Centre, which was part of the college at the time, and uh, he did one of the courses that I was running as was, one of the, was, was the first distance education uh, course that was run out of the college back in the day. And uh, he, he took my course, which was called The Global Classroom, and it was introducing people to the idea of how you can connect to other people and all this wonderful stuff that you can do when you aren't actually in the same place as each other. This was before the World Wide Web. This was back in the day that we had telephones and those big cow pat things that you put on tables and things. And, and Nick, as I say, he did my course and he failed it. He still holds that against me. Um, uh, and part of the reason he failed it was not because of me, but because he submitted his final assignment as a series of HTML scripts on Notepad that linked together could only be read if you had a browser that you could open them up in. And the powers to be, the powers that be in the college wouldn't accept that. Right? But that was Nick. And um, after that though, we became good mates and he would I'd be in all sorts of lectures and, and things at the college and I'd get this phone call, Derek. Have you got a few minutes? I've got this whole bunch of teachers sitting in the education centre and they'd like to hear about such and such. Can you talk to them? And, uh, and so that, that began. He, he was quite a visionary uh, um, in terms of how, how to run PLD, how to do all that sort of thing. And of course, he's the guy whose imagination gave rise to the whole concept of breaking the country down into clusters and, and having the very first PICT PLD in a cluster base, rather than individual schools, getting schools to cluster together and um, make that happen. And then sort of in the background was me, uh, and I guess some of the things that my claim to fame, I was really, uh, I was working as in the ed tech area of the college, but I got really involved with distance education because all my teaching had been rural, remote areas of New Zealand, and I'd learned the value of staying connected and learning from uh, people in other places, right back to the days when Massey University used to have its, its extension. But when I went to the Teachers College, I was given some amazing opportunities and had the, the privilege of setting up the Polo Program. Any, any graduates of Polo Program? Do you do teachers come everywhere? And there's no one putting their hand up here. Oh, we have got a few. Oh, great. If I had a prize, I'd give it to you, but there we are. Um, but that, that carried on for about 26 years out of the University of Canterbury. And, and the drive for that was an equity drive. When I went into areas and found you know, that there were people who really wanted to become teachers around the place, but who, for all sorts of reasons, weren't able to make the sacrifice of moving to the big smoke and having that there. Well, I got the, the year, 1994, when I set up the first, oh, sorry, 1995, set up the first program, I got a phone call in 1994 from the deputy principal of Pangaroo Area School and said, Derek, We've got a whole heap of people up here who'd love to be teachers. They can't up in Boston universities. We've moved down the country. We tried Auckland, they said no. We tried Waikato, they said no. We went to Massey, they said no. We went to Victoria, they said no. We're coming down to you. If you can't say it, we'll have to try Old Target. Goodness me. And, they, and I said, well, tell you what, have I got the deal for you? We just happened to have set up this polo program. We could take all you guys on. They said, no, well, that'll be all right, but we really want to make it something that is unique to our culture, that reflects where we are in Pangaroo. And so we went through a bit of negotiation. I got my hand smacked many times, but I was quite used to that. And we developed a regional version of that for the teachers in Pangaroo. I was up there just a few years ago. We were celebrating the 20 years since their, their graduation. 
this wonderful group of people who went through and who remained in education, many of them sort of getting to retirement now, like I, like I was. And, and we set the same thing up in Tairawhiti, in Te Aroroa, in, in, um, and in Rotorua. And, and that a whole idea that we can stretch the boundaries, push the boundaries. Why do we have to come to one place to do this when that place can move to you? And so that's really my background. The other thing that I did while I was there was set up the Virtual Learning Network. Uh, in New Zealand. Uh, with Carol Moffat, we started that off in 1994 as well. So the three of us with those varying backgrounds got together and we met a guy, um, I, I was supposed to be doing this through that, somewhere, Oop, here we go. See that was my, I, I suck Sarah, okay. but we met this guy, Professor Stephen Heppel. Now this is a little bit of a history, a history lesson. So Stephen Heppel, UK, uh, God, I don't actually think he's a legitimate professor, but they call him Professor Hebel, uh, and he likes it. But I'm going to show you this little video. Listen to what this, this inspired us. People often ask, what is Ultralab? Why is Ultralab? Um, I can answer some of that anyway. Uh, Ultralab's an extraordinary place, really been around for 15 years or more, the individuals in it for longer than that. Team of people, best in Europe for sure, maybe, maybe arguably best in the world now, um, focused on really making learning a little more delightful through using harnessing technology. Sounds a simple thing to do, but when you come down to it, building robotic toys, building learning communities, helping design a prison, building new schools, working on the curriculum, looking at assessment techniques, bringing great communities of head teachers together, exploring how we might build better schools for the children who've been excluded from school. So many, many, many projects. Fundamentally, they're all heading in the same direction. We see new technologies as giving us an opportunity to explore the things that we haven't really been able to do before in learning. And uh, it's a pretty passionate bunch here. Um, 64 people now. I think only four have ever left, which is unusual in its own way. And the reason we have that stability, I think, is there's just a joy in the job and the work that we're doing here together really are moving the world forward a little, changing the world bit by bit, but we're not doing that on our own. We only do it with the extraordinary imagination of teachers, of children, of policy makers, uh, of cultures and communities all the way around the world. I like to think we've been uh, a catalyst in making the world a slightly better place. Certainly we've been a big part of making learning a more delightful experience. It's been a nice thing to do. How could you not be inspired by that? Huh? And, and so Stephen, visited New Zealand in 1999, had a meeting with Nick and I in my office at the College Bed, and um, we, we hatched a plan. We thought, what if we could make an opportunity, create the opportunity for an ultra lab in the Southern Hemisphere and work in collaboration with these guys in the North, Northern Hemisphere? And so the baton was passed. It was a baton passed. And we, we got together and, uh, and Ultimately, in 2003, April, we formed Ultra Lab South, which later became CORE. And there's another whole backstory I won't go into today because it got a bit political and a bit sad in parts. But um, one of the things we did when we sat down, we said, every good organisation has to have a mission statement, doesn't it? And any of you who may have a memory or an association with Vince Ham will know he was a real wordsmith. He was, he was a great craftsman with words. And so we got together and we gathered the ideas from all the people that we knew and talked to teachers and about what we wanted to create this organisation. And our mission statement ran to one and three quarter pages. It was a really fascinating read. But of course, that didn't help many people who, um, who you know, they needed, they needed it on the top of their tongue. And ultimately, our mission statement got refined to this, pushing the boundaries of educational possibility. Right? And it's something that's been um, really deep in my heart and I know with Vince and I know with Nick as we were getting. And we started just a small team. By 2009, this was the crowd, we had a photograph taken out there today. Uh, and 2009, there was a, this, this group of people um, had gotten together and you see that there were a whole lot of boundaries that we were starting to push as you go through there, and some of you might recognise, there may be some e-fellows among the group here. Any e-fellows? Any people who did that? Members of the 10 trends? Yeah? Remember things like the early childhood? That was one of Vince's favourites, the early childhood girls, the EC girls. It was known Vince and his easy girls. Um, <laughs> but 
brought, bringing a whole different way of working into early childhood. Great stuff. Really pushing the boundaries. And by 10 years later, that, that small group had grown to over 250 people. All pushing the boundaries. All driven by the dream and the aspiration that was the seed of which came really from that, that dream of Stephen Heppel. Making the place a better place, making the world a better place. And doing it by instilling a heart of joy. Focusing on the culture ahead of structures. Focusing on relationships ahead of rules. Focusing on the way in which we can make the caring of the people that we're working in the interests of the primary thing that we do. So what are some of the boundaries that, that we were really involved with here? Well, I, I thought I'd take a big picture view here and you'll see how it relates to later because we are in a world, as we heard from our, our earlier speakers, I was sitting here listening to Michelle this morning and I just was kind of enamoured with, with what she was saying and she was talking about how the very structure of our education system is, is not suited to all our learners. Uh, uh, the same thing was Hannah following that up, that it, the, the colonised uh, way in which we have embraced education systems from before doesn't suit very many people. In fact, it doesn't suit anybody. Right? And so if you think about it, the fundamental organisation of our, our model of schooling, it's you know, single-paced, classroom-based, teacher-led instruction. When I set up the the uh, polo program, that was the same thing. Teacher education, single pace, one place, follow through. And we broke the boundary there and created something that proved you can actually become a really top-notch educator who has a qualification that will let you teach anywhere in a different way. We need to be doing the same thing because the product of the consequences of persisting with that model, and we've had the challenge in just about every workshop that I've attended in this conference, the, the consequence of doing it, we will perpetuate this whole idea of compliance and conformity. Right? That's what it's designed for, of boredom and truancy, and of equity, inequity at least, and exclusion. Right? Now, we, we are fired up after a conference like today, and where I'm going to go with this is to fire you up a little bit more as you can leave. But this is the heritage that we have as a system. And within that system, we have learners of all kinds. We have those with disabilities, we have Māori learners, we've got Pacifica learners. And the equity argument applies right across the board. I, I can't stand here and tell a story of having huge lack of privilege. I, I come from a family of eight. My mum was the first in her family to have gone off to uh, become a teacher, a home economics teacher. My father was a builder. He worked six and a half days every week to just keep us going. But we were, we were loved, we were cherished. We had real privilege in my upbringing. We never had a lot, but we had what we had was great. And I, I grew up believing that I could do the sorts of things that I've ended up sort of becoming, I guess. But the boundaries for so many people prevent that from happening. And so my story really is, believing that we've got to redress that. Right? We've, got to, we've got to do it. If anyone's interested, I do a little bit of an advertisement here. There's, if you're genuinely interested in any of this sort of thing, there's a book, it may still be out the front, that uh, was, we wrote at CORE. Vince and I edited it. It's got a whole heap of chapters written by people like yourselves who were involved in those first 10 years. And they've, they've articulated and documented that story of what it was like to be pushing the boundaries in their own way through there. So we've, we were down to about the last 50 copies, and it's been sitting out the front for people to take and just offer a koha. And a koha is, is actually going to the Lower Hut Food Bank, where my wife works, so there's a personal interest there, but it's also where Papa Nick was devoting a whole lot of his time. In fact, he had had a big meeting about that just before he fell ill. So if you're interested, on, on with the talk. The because the boundaries need to keep, there's still more boundaries. We've heard lots of those in this conference so far. And I've got some of those listed up there. You know, the boundaries that we face with exclusion and the inequity that sits around there. We've got learner agency coming up. Talk about that more in a moment. But we've got um, the issues around digital literacy and digital exclusion there biculturalism, and then all those things about education for the future. This is what got me fired up. I thought I'd sort of stepped back four or five years ago when it was we, we 
sort of handed the reins over at Core. I went to Wellington and uh, started to spend a lot more time with my six grandkids that I've got up there. And I was looking at them saying, they're getting just as crummy a deal as, as anyone did. Right? We've still got a lot of ground. So I set up Future Makers as, as a vehicle that I could use for continuing to, to do the things that I really believe passionately about and continuing to work with some schools, with educators, with governments, with different countries, in fact, to push those boundaries. Because otherwise, the world that these young people are growing up into is, is going to be so complex for the things that they need to face. The climate change issues, the food security issues, the cyber security issues, the threats to our peace and democracy. These are things that I didn't have to think about much growing up or in my teaching. But these will be the issues that are on the table. And unless we have a new way of thinking and a new way of engaging, it's going to get pretty awful. I mentioned the, the learner agency. To me, the idea of putting the learner at the centre, and I look, I know how crass that can sound nowadays, but it is where the shift is. The shift. Our, our system wasn't set up to have the learner at the centre. Our system was set up, if you look at the legislation and the policy and the funding, our system set up about schools, right, and the rights of teachers and so forth. Way, way, way down the track, you might start thinking about learners. And the concept of learner agency sits at the centre of that. My wife is an early childhood teacher. Oh, actually, that's what she trained as. She's done all sorts of other things. But I learned from her very early on. I'd never, I'd never come across the concept of agency in my own teacher education training. But through her, every book on her bookshelf had concept of learner agency in it. And I started to become really intrigued that this wasn't just about putting the learner at the centre and suddenly thinking about, you know, I used to teach one lesson for one class and now I've got to teach 25 lessons for 25 kids. This is actually about personal empowerment. It's about creating a sense of personal direction and uh, capability. It's about providing and offering choices and ensuring that I've got the ability to follow through on those choices that I have. And so another little uh, um, advertisement here, but I've just finished writing a book on this that so you might be interested. It's going to be available free uh, going up to America next week, where it's going to be launched at the Aurora Conference. So if you want to uh, get a copy of that, just sign up to the Future Maker newsletter because I'll send a note out to everybody. But you'll see what we've done with this thing, a couple of American educators who actually came to New Zealand for all their ideas. We've been working in their schools back there to make the change. And now on the basis of that, right there, I don't expect you'll read everything, but on the right, what we've done is we've identified seven conditions. So Hannah talked about how we need to be deliberate about the way we design our, our learning and design things. We've called the book uh, Agency by Design because it doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen just because you provide a few extra toys and give them some choices and let them run around. There are some things you can do. So on one side, we're looking at, so what are the conditions that you can deliberately design that will enable more agentic learning to happen? And then the other side is looking at seven things, which are, what are the characteristics that you will see fostered in that? All right, advertisement over as we move on. So imagine this. Imagine if all that we did was to create an education system that truly prepared young learners for their future. Not just for the future we see now. I have a really big concern, I'll share it with you. This is, this is part of our narrative at the moment when we're talking about lifting kids out of poverty, when we're talking about taking uh, students, family, whānau who are living in the low paid and low income jobs and lifting them, we're, we're not really yet answering the question, well, so who's going to be the people that take over those jobs? That's a more fundamental question about our future that we haven't started thinking about. Because under our colonial Western world view of the economy, we need those jobs. Our whole view of the economy and our world means we have to have a whole people who are low paid. Otherwise, the people at this end can't enjoy their jet boats and their multi-million dollar mansions and things. That's why it is. We're going to have to push through that 
and push the boundaries, not just to lift people out of a poverty area, but actually look at the fabric of our society and say to these people, us, the people in this room who fit that category a lot, what are you prepared to give up? What are you prepared to set aside and live differently so that those people don't have to be in those lay paid jobs? There's a message for some of our careers counsellors and the mindsets that we have in our schools when we're creating aspiration for our kids. Imagine if everything we were able to do were inclusive, equitable and connected. Imagine that, where we didn't have to think about those barriers and boundaries and fences and blocks. I've, I've got a daughter who uh, is disabled. She's been in a wheelchair ever since she was born. She was born in the spine of a fitter. Wonderful kid, has uh, suffered mental health issues because of the, the, the um, hydrocephalus that, that affects all kids like that to some degree or another. And so she's been an, a, a valued member of our family. One of the most valuable things is that her four siblings have grown up with her and see different as not being different, really. I mean, Madeline was the, was the girl who would uh, go to the sports day. Athletic sports was never a barrier to her. You know, long jump, she was fabulous. She would wheel up as fast as she could and then two kids would come and throw her out. <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she saw herself as just the same as everybody. But imagine if our classrooms and our our, our communities were such that we had that sort of sense that difference isn't defined by a disability or by culture or by ethnic uh, um, you know, category, if you like. Well, then what about another what if? What about if education was about discovering the love of learning and not the fear of failing? That's a profound one. I can't claim that. I saw it on Twitter last week. I thought, all right, I'm going to take it. Okay. But isn't that great? What if it was? And you go, so if you're sitting there thinking, I'm going to take this baton today from you learn back to my classroom, how am I going to make learning something that kids love, that they feel joy when they come to school and not a fear of learning? Well, here's where I change tack because I'm, I'm a really big guy into system stuff, but this is really all about you. As we come to the end of this conference, I want to put the message right back on you and me. And this is something I wrote in a blog post a little while ago, so forgive me if I just put it up and read it through. In a system where we see an increase in cynicism and overwhelm, achieving transformative, transformative change cannot rely solely on government mandates or policy amendments. And we've had adjustments, we've heard that, haven't we? Instead, the key lies in the personal transformation of educators themselves. And by nurturing their own growth, your own growth and resilience, and the belief of the potential of every student, teachers become agents of profound change. We heard that several times, didn't we? We heard that in that video clip that Hannah had earlier on, where the person said, you know, the, the family said, um, that teacher cared for our son. Remember that one, mm -hmm. the, the, the little autistic fellow? We heard it when Stacy acknowledged one of the staff here. Right? You, you treated me differently at school. Right? It's, it's, we can do this, we can do this. We possess the power to transform education and reach those who are alienated or underserved. In the same way as we had the challenge from Michelle this morning, heck, there's enough of us here to go and uproot the monument, she said. Right? Why do we sit there and trembling and wait for what the next thing might be out of our Ministry of Education? Why should we trust them when they've lost the plot so much? <laughs> there is no vision, there's no leadership, there's no purpose. We must claim that back. It's sad for me to say that I worked for them for a while. But we are, we are fudging it in a soup that we can't see through. It's up to us. By emphasising our personal transformation, we empower educators 
to be the architects of lasting change, weaving a new narrative of hope and possibility in education. I fundamentally believe that. It's about you. Those messages that you have heard, those things that you have heard through this conference, it's up to you to take back to school now. It's up to you to be just as infectious as COVID-19 <laughs> in your staff rooms and your communities. So I'm going to finish. I've got four, uh, three, uh, yeah, three, I've still got four fingers left, but I'll take three. Three things I want to ask you, Hero. And here I'm drawing on the stories of some people I've had the privilege of meeting in the last little while. So the first one I go is, what is it that drives you? What drives you to be to do what you Where does your motivation come from? And are you clear about your purpose? Now, I could give a whole keynote on this, but I want to just share a short video clip. And uh, this video clip is, um, last year I was in, up at, speaking at a conference in Wisconsin, and one of the speakers there was a guy by the name of Michael Jr. Anyone come across him? Comedian? All right, great. Man, I could have spent ages listening to him. I've got his book to, to remind. Great guy. Michael Jr. holds these um, kind of video television sessions called um, Break Time. You see it sitting there. And sometimes in the middle of his thing, he'll talk to someone in the audience because he, he's, he's a comedian, but he, he goes deep into connecting with who we are as people and what is going to change our lives and what will transform it. And so in these things, he'll pick on someone to tell their story and he, he will weave this in. This is almost making me cry now. This really touches me. Listen to this. So you're a musical director? Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so... Um... Let me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That where I could see. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, all right. Now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know the version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the that saved a wretch like me. him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. Don't need to say any more, do I? So when you leave here today, are you leaving with folders full of notes about what you're going to do, or is the thing that's touched you most why you're doing it? All right. So that's, that's my number one. What motivates you? Why do you get out of bed every morning? Why do you persist in what you're doing? What's driving you? Do you know your why? And I think as you unpack and you go back through everything that you've heard from various speakers today and, and yesterday and the day before, that's the thing to listen for. What's touching my heart? What is connecting 
with who I am and what I, what I think. The next question is very closely related to that. And it's, where do your beliefs come from? There's been quite a bit mentioned, not surprisingly, because we're only a week away from election time, but there's been a lot of talk about elections. And we're hearing these conflicting messages coming out all over the place, which we often do. Right? One of the challenges for us is to know where do those people get those beliefs from? I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to go through this quickly. I've got a card game for you on this one. Under this are three people who have had a huge impact on education in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The first guy, Frederick Taylor. Oh, it might be familiar to her. I'll put the date that he was born and died there because these three guys all come from a similar kind of time frame. Frederick Taylor was uh, around at the time of the Industrial Revolution when people were really ramping up factories and decided we've got to make these factories work more efficiently and more effectively. This is the time where we decided we needed lots of low paid workers in our economy. Right? And those low paid workers, however, needed to have the fundamentals of reading and writing to be able to work in these factories. So we needed to be able to work with them in ways that um, set things up. One of his greatest, uh, well, before you get there, so in the factories, they set up all these time and motion things. That's where it came from. We're here, if any of you have done economics, you know, Taylorism goes right back to this guy. This is the idea of where the systems are worth more than the people. Right? Our systems are what will win us. We've got to place them above the people. Right? And one of his greatest advocates was a guy by the name of Edward uh, Thorn Edward Ed Wood Thorndike. Got it right, Edward Thorndike, who some might remember that name. One of the most profound architects of the modern education system. Right? And Thorndike, having sat and listened to what was happening in the factories, said, "Yep, the main goal of education." is to sort young people according to their ability. That's where it started. You heard Hannah talking, some of you heard Hannah talking about this before in our own New Zealand legislation when it came to deciding Māori, we're not even going to wait to sort them, we just categorise them. Farm workers, farmers' wives. Right? It all sheets back to there. The second person I've got here, familiar to some of you, John Dewey. All right? John Dewey was a real advocate for progressive education and said, actually, we don't learn by going through the churn. We learn because of our experience. We learn by doing stuff. We learn alongside others. And he brought in a huge amount of stuff that impacted me personally in my training around student-centered learning, put the learner at the center. Could go into that for Third person, wonder who's under here? <coughs> Why have I chosen Surapadana Nata? Because I've done quite a lot of work up on the East Coast and I was really drilled in his influence and, and his background there and came to highly regard and respect that influence and what it means. But he, here's a man who sort of had a foot in two worlds, who was very concerned that as the Tayloristic origins of education were coming into New Zealand, that uh, the Maori culture was being left behind and worked tirelessly to, to meld those two worlds so they could coexist, not meld into one, but coexist, where each would be valued and each would be taken ahead. And he also brought, in a Māori worldview, the notion of a holistic view, not, not compartmentalising everything down into subjects and frameworks and all this, but actually, how do we bind that as to the, the, the essence of whanaungatanga, and uh, it's sitting in, in the way that that was uh, given expression. Of course, he started the first um, Māori uh, u university college uh, on the basis of that, alongside working in health and all these other areas. And education was just one of those things. And so his, his life's work, I, I, my interpretation of that, and I just had a real quick read of the chapter about him as well to reinforce it. That was the thing in um, Stacey's book. But really, a lot of what he introduced was the counter to colonialism. It was the, the roots of where we go. So we've got three people there whose belief systems are very, very different from each other, but whose belief systems carry us forward now. And if we summarise those things, what do we get out of it? the legacy from this guy? It's all about control, conformity and compliance. You like what I've done with the C's there? There's more coming. No? <laughs> But that characterises our legislation and what we do in the world today. What do we get from Dewey? Well, he was all about, life is about a challenge. 
It's about curiosity and how we work with each other to do that and about the connectedness because we can't do it alone, taken up by Vygotsky a few years later. Right? What about here? Embedded this in our cultural context. They understand the culture, who we are, our identity, our language is important in what we bring. It's who we are and who we turn up as that is more important than what we're going to have shoved down our throats. It's about the context that we are learning in that's important. Right? And then I've put in colonialism in inverted commas because it's the how we counter that that becomes important. Now you look at that. And you think about what we're facing today, where we've got these conflicting beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. And we polarise them, we see them in our staff rooms, we hear them in our communities, and we, we argue about them at such superficial levels without tracing it back and being able to understand what the beliefs are that are causing us to think like that. And it's all so binary. And it's not just because we're in a digital age. Right? We, we see these things happen. So here's, here's a little challenge here before I move to the last point. Uh, any of you have come across Roger Martin, really worth checking out on internet, lots of YouTube clips, all that sort of stuff. He's a, a professor over in Harvard, but I, he, he talks about the idea of integrative thinking, and he talks about how he's brought this into the business world and things. But I love this quote, the ability to face constructively the tension of opposing models or beliefs, and instead of choosing one at the expense of the other, to generate a creative resolution to the tension in the form of a new model that contains elements of the individual models, but ultimately is superior to each. Wouldn't we be living in a wonderful world if we could embrace the concept of, of that integrative thinking this isn't, this isn't melting pot ideas. This is, this is the stuff that still recognises and values the identity and the, 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 the individuality of what's here, but being able to mesh it in a way where we can live together and, and forge the way ahead. So my third thing is, what's the story you're creating? This baton that's being passed, as you pick it up, each day, when you go back into school next week on Monday, what's the story you create? Because every day in the classroom, whether you realise it or not, you are writing a new chapter in the lives of the kids that you teach. And so I want to share this one. This is a, a guy I was at uh, another conference I was speaking just a couple of months ago in America. I met this young guy, all right? And um, Dwayne Reed, he's in Chicago. He's, uh, he's in about a fifth year of teaching, I think, now. He, um, and as any of you know Chicago, he's on the other side of Chicago in a pretty tough area. And um, he's a delightful guy that you'd all love to have in your school as an educator. So when he was at, um, uh, in, in, uh, finishing his senior year of, of college and getting ready to go and do his uh, student teaching, he was faced with going into a fourth grade class and he thought right back to his own story and thought what got me interested in school was not the stuff we did necessarily but it was about knowing someone cared for me. He says I want my kids to know I care for them before they come. So he made this video, it went viral, some of you may have seen it, watch this. <laughs> to the fourth grade so happy to meet you can't wait till i see you gonna have a good time we'll learn about science find ways to apply it and i bet that you'll like it we're gonna have a good time welcome to the fourth grade hello Teacher. My name's Mr. Reed and it's very nice to meet ya I'm from Chicago, I love eating pizza and I dress to impress But I still rock sneakers, it's my first year teacher So it's all real exciting, got some ideas and I really like to try them Like making songs to remember what you hear We'll be learning so much by the end of the year to So I'm just going to stop there because you can go and watch the whole thing This is a delightful young guy, as you can tell he's a rapper he brings all that, he's written books for kids, 
and um, to bring him into the classroom. He does. He was bullied at school. He talks about how his mother, however, said, you are the most beautiful boy. I believe in you. And that's what got him through. And so he says this to her, you are more than a student. You are a scholar. You are more than your test scores. You are scholarly. You excel. You're the cream of the crop. And Mr. Reed cares about you. Right? There's a message for us as we go out. Uh, it's a pretty short time to get it all out, but I hope that's been meaningful. I want to challenge you on passing the baton, pushing the boundaries. Right? Your chance is to accept that as you move from this conference and go out next week back to your school. And it's not just about being a Mr. Reed, it's being a whole school of Mr. Reeds. It's about infecting your community as Mr. Reeds. And it's bringing to life that sense of respect for everybody's worth and value who's in your community. With that, I'll leave you. Ka kite. Thank you so much for your deep and really insightful whakaaro. I've just got a couple of questions. It's on me that we don't have that much time, sorry. Uh, so I just wanted to ask one thing, and I, re I really liked your uh, analogy about the baton, because the baton change requires both people to be ready, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and placing, working together, ensuring that we both know what we're engaging with. So I thought it was a really good analogy. Anything else about that? baton uh, analogy that you think that we should really think about on a daily basis? There's, a, there's, a, there's one little thing, I guess, it, it, it involves also letting go. And sometimes those of us who are like me, you know, we think it should always be as it's always been, right? And we are sometimes not prepared to let it go. So that would be another important part. And sometimes it dings on the ground too. Oh, we well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get... But what do you think, this is one of the questions that's come in, what do you think are going to be the most important issues in education for the next five years? Well, <laughs> I, th I think we've got three main issues. One is uh, what has been a major focus of this conference uh, around bringing the, the equity, restoring the sense of worth and dignity of every individual, and, and we've seen that really well exhibited here. I think another one is we've got to change the structures and systems that are getting in the way of, of that for everybody. We, we, we are living in a Tayloristic world still, and we've got to invent, it's not as if there's another system that we can bring in, we've got to, and we will only do that by us doing that. Can't, can't depend on them. And I think there was a third one that just went from my mind, um, but it'll come back. <laughs> As a parent on two school boards, one being a public school, one being an independent school, um, an equity issue that I'd like to work on is pay equity for teachers. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Um, and actually on the independent board, we have a really high finance um, person who's amazing. And she says she sees it um, moving. It has to change. It yeah. has to become in line with, say, Australia. And then, and then um, in terms of teaching and how sustainable it is to be a teacher, what can you offer people until we get to that place of more equity for pay for teachers? I mean, what, as a t teacher, what as a parent, I believe you deserve? I think pay, pay is one thing, uh, and, and Tom, I, I, I accept that. But the, the other, the other, there are two other parts. One is conditions, and the other part is just the perception. Well two quick stories. Finland managed to turn its education system around by taking a, a long-term view. One of the strategies they had was to say, we've got to stop dissing teachers. And so they made it not illegal, but pretty much prepared that close. Newspapers were not allowed to print stories that were negative about education, about teachers. They had to print the stuff that was uplifting, that, that told the good stories. And that had a profound change. The other little story I tell you this uh, some of you know my Nick is an ICU. I was in ICU uh, sitting alongside, and a nurse came up to me. Nick's partner is a, is a teacher also. And we were sitting there listening, and this nurse, unbelievable care they get in ICU, really top notch. And this nurse, she would have been, uh, she was younger than me, but she was still middle age, 
uh, and she was so efficient in her job, and she made a comment to one of her other nurses as they came past about, I'll, I'll get onto that after I finish my shift. <coughs> and so I said to her, so tell me about your shift, when, when does that happen? She said, oh, we, we work um, uh, 12 hours, right? So we work from, you know, full 12 hours, three days in a row. Right? And I was sitting there going, <laughs> you know, we think that, see, see, she said, it's the best job in the world because then I get, whatever, four or five days off. She said, I get a chance to de-stress, put it aside from me. And she described, I think it was 10 days in a month that she's on ICU. But I turned to, to, to Nick's partner next to me. I said, wouldn't it be amazing if teaching could be a career that didn't put us in the box for that period of time and intent, where, where there was an opportunity to act as a professional with more flexibility over our hours and we work and that yeah. we could de-stress. Yeah. Good, I love that. Um, just quickly, I've got a friend who's an ICU nurse, so I just assume she'd be really patient and a great teacher. She told me she can do ICU, that's all good, she can handle all of that, but she tried to teach her child the alphabet, she said after 10 <laughs> minutes, she said that's an F and C, okay? <laughs> So then I go to Katoji, now I'm going to ask you this. Amazing. Still as inspiring as you have always been, Derek. Such a it's yours now. <laughs> Uh, no tanto este guay marinés.